So hello and welcome to the Renegade Economist talk show. It gives me huge pleasure to introduce Steve Keane. He's come over from Sydney to London to launch his book. Uh, and he's the, he's the Associate Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Western Sydney. Welcome. Thank you, Rob. Um, so, uh, Steve, let's start by me uh, saying that you were right about the global economy. Mm. Right? Uh, do you now feel vindicated? Uh, vindication takes a long time because when you, when you call a crisis like this, it isn't just a case of a, what is going to be a two or three year dip. It's not picking a turning point in a standard cycle. Right. This is saying it's an absolute juncture point which will continue going down for some substantial period. So I'll feel vindicated after about eight to ten years, unfortunately. That's a long time. That's a long time. But, but admirably, you're sticking to your guns and you see this as an opportunity to rewrite the economic model. If yeah, you're... I mean, the, the whole reason that Keynes failed to convert the discipline was that he had a heart attack at the wrong time and the conventional thinkers like John Hicks got in there and totally ruined Keynes's visions and that's what became seen as Keynes's economics. So we are after the Great Depression, which should have been enough of a wake-up call for economic theory at the time, we went back to an even more deluded version of what had preceded the Keynes's work, the neoclassical school of the 1920s that Keynes derided by saying in one statement that uh, uh, I accused the, 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 we call it the classical school, but I accused the, what we call now neoclassical school of being one of those pretty polite techniques designed for a, a well-panelled board, uh, boardroom which tries to deal with the present by abstracting the, fu the from the fact we know nothing about the future. Now, what's, Put that in layman's term. What it means is what we do today is affected by our expectations about the future. And Keynes was one of the first people to make a strong argument about that. The neoclassical theory he was fighting at the time ignored that role mm. and said, we, we pretended he didn't need to know what was going to happen in the future to make your investment decisions today. And of course, Keynes said, we do have to, have to know that, but we can't. Therefore, we act in a, in a veil of complete uncertainty. And therefore, our behaviour is affected by our expectations of the future rather than what we can actually know about the unknowable. And that, therefore, determines investment behaviour, which makes capitalism a highly unstable system. Uh, but they pretend it was completely stable by completely ignoring the issue of the future. Well, fast forward to where we are now, and what neoclassicals have done since then is, first of all, trammel over Keynes's logic, so what they called Keynes, uh, what first were called the ISLM models by, developed by Hicks, had nothing to do with Keynes. Hicks admitted that in the late 1970s. Uh, but they rebuilt a theory in which they had what they call rational expectations. Now, it sounds great to say you're rational, you know, what a neoclassical person means by rational is what the English language dictionary means by prophetic. And so they, rather than saying, is, is the, is the pre-Keynesian neoclassical school, as Keynes said, dealt with the present by abstracting from the fact we know little about the future, yeah. the post-Keynes neoclassical school deals with the present by pretending we can predict the future accurately. That's no damn wonder they didn't see this crisis coming, because A, they think they predict the future, and B, the future's always rosy. So how did you spot it? And, and I suppose more yeah. interestingly, how did you, get, how did you um, rid yourself of all the dogma and all the, the misinformation that you've just explained and, and be able to see through that and, and then stand in that lonely position to say, hang on. It is a lonely position. But I've got quite a few colleagues. I've got a, there's a huge school of non-orthodox economists. So there's a minority within the academic economics profession that I'm part of that group. Um, I have to say I was lucky. Uh, there's something about being born at the time when the Vietnam War was on and I was facing conscription which made you think about philosophical and social issues in a way that doesn't necessarily happen today when the main question is whether you buy an iPod or, iPod or an Android, uh, at least before the crisis hit. And I had someone disturb my mental picture of economic theory in my very first year at university, which was an English academic uh, moved to Australia for six months and has been there for 40 years called Frank Stilwell at the University of Sydney. And what Frank did was teach us something in the first six months of first year that is normally only taught in the last six months of an honours course. And by the time you've got that deeply ingrained into it and you strike this particular anomaly, if you strike it at all, you brush it off. But when I struck that what right... Mean, what do you mean you brush it off? Well, you think, oh, well, it's a curly little thing we have to take account of in later developments of the theory, but the theory is still sound. What he taught is a thing called the theory of the second best. Right. And that... Uh, is an argument that if this neoclassical theory says free markets are best and competitive situations are best, so we should have a whole lot of small firms and a whole lot of disorganised workers. We shouldn't have large firms and unions. Okay. But the, th the theory of the second best is, well, let's say we're starting from a position where we have lots of large firms with market power 
and unions facing them with bargaining power, what happens if you abolish one but not the other? And the theory of the second best that things will get worse. Right. Okay. Whereas the general theory says abolish both, you'll get things better. Right. So taking one step towards nirvana, in fact, took you to purgatory, which I thought this is something, if the theory is this weak, if that simple acknowledgement of reality disturbs the theory so badly, yeah. there's got to be something rotten here. And I began looking at that right from the, um, I think I, I actually dated to that to about July or August of uh, 1971. So from that point on, I was looking at the theory and saying, there must be something, a, a deeper flaw here to enable something as, that apparently such robust and strong conclusions that make most neoclassical economists anti-monopoly and anti-union. Yeah. If you suddenly prove that if there are monopolies and you have unions, then you shouldn't abolish unions. And ipso facto, there are monopolies out there, or there are large corporations, so therefore you need to have unions organising workers to get their fair share. Uh, that just put a hole right through that mental picture for me. And I had to say there had to be a more coherent way to think about the economy, as well as having flaws in this one. And I then spent really my next 40 years pulling apart the theory. It's exceptional. Um, and the work that you've done, because as you said, you've got to knock down every pillar of this. Mm. Because mm. if you leave one thing standing... They'll reel the whole damn lot on that one edifice. Yeah. And and because uh, they're very clever, uh, the guys who benefit from this, mm. who we'll come on to, are very clever at using these arguments to, well, loot the system. And, well, it's, these guys, are not, they don't do the looting. This is a bit like the priests who justify what the emperor does. Mm -hmm. Okay, The emperor does the looting, the priests justify the system. And fundamentally, neoclassical economists are the priests of capitalism. Yeah. But the priests don't necessarily know that there's God. Okay, They have this model, model of God. And ditto with uh, neoclassical economics. They have a model of capitalism, which is almost, but not quite, completely unlike actual capitalism. And therefore, what happens is they don't even realise that they've erected a smoke screen mm. behind which people, if you want, if, you, if they want to rip the system off, then there's plenty of avenues being created by these guys because these priests are saying the system reaches equilibrium, and the more you remove government intervention and controls, the faster it'll get there. So let's abolish silly, silly laws like Glass Steagall, for example. And let's get rid of that, and let's abolish trade unions, and let's get rid of. Um, tariff barriers and let's get all, all this stuff and everything will work hunky dory. Yeah. You know, and in the back background, the, this causes immense chaos in the real world. And various you know, sharks who are out there can go up picking up the carcasses and making a fortune out of it. But the, the neoclassical economists themselves are among the most altruistic individuals I have ever known. That's interesting. But the irony is, altruism is no defence. Okay. Because this, I quote this in the new edition of Debunking Economics. I had a, a fabulous uh, teacher back in my school days who ran what have religion classes and let us have open discussion, uh, never intervening. And one day, one of the students made a comment about some politician whom we were debating over, and he says, "Well, at least he's sincere." And the class sort of murmured, "Oh, yeah. Well, nobody could deny the guy was sincere." And this teacher, who normally kept quiet, piped up from the back of the room and said, "Don't overrate sincerity." The most sincere person you'll meet in your life is the maniac chasing you down the road with an axe trying to chop your head off. Now, I never found out what made him have that insight, but yeah. it's true. These guys sincerely believe they're doing good, yeah. and they're actually doing all this stuff not for their own benefit, because they believe it'll make society better. Right, right. What they're creating is a dysfunctional society that's now crashed into the global financial crisis. How do we start? And I, and I know that debunking e uh, economics, the revised, uh, expanded version is the yeah. naked, naked emperor dethroned. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's a, a shot of the cover of the book. How do we start? Because let me tell you, we've made a, an awful lot of people around the world have, have seen the kind of call to arms, if you like, yeah. and seen that this is an opportunity to put a new economic paradigm in place yeah. that actually benefits people and planet mm. broadly. We've made the Four Horsemen film, and in it we compare the uh, Gutenberg's printing press um, mm. with the royal and ecclesiastical elite, uh, and, and the cloud of unknowing uh, dispersing, if yeah. you like. And this is also the case with economics, is yeah. it not? And books like this and what you're doing with your blog and all mm. that. But in pr practically, how do you see it working out? How, how do we see the affecting change? Well, you have to give people a realistic picture of the system they're in. It, I already see our, our period in economics now being a bit like when Copernicus and Tycho Brahe and Galileo turn up and say, look, the universe doesn't revolve around the Earth. The Earth revolves around the Sun. Okay, And it says, you're looking at the world, you're seeing almost precisely the same picture, but your frame of reference is wrong. 
Now, once you do that, you've got this enormous resistance, first of all, because when you say something like that, you suddenly throw up a whole, a whole lot of things that people have a simple explanation for suddenly evaporate. So if you have a, an Earth-centric view of the universe, your explanation for why things fall down is things always go towards the centre. Now you're suddenly told, no, the Earth is not the centre, the Sun is. Well, if you throw something up in the air, why doesn't it go to the Sun then? So you suddenly have an entirely new range of problems thrown at you by what is fundamentally a deeper way of understanding how the system functions. So we're at that stage. Yes. And you really have to break people away from that mental picture of seeing the world the way the neoclassicals portray it, because it's become so deeply ingrained in people's minds that that is really the main barrier to understanding the system itself. And think about how we talk about uh, the astronomical events these days. We still talk about sunrise. We should be calling it Earth Rotate. But that, the mental picture from those, those past days of seeing the sun rise around the Earth is still our mental picture of that particular astronomical phenomenon. The same thing for the economy. We still think about capitalism as a barter system which reaches equilibrium. And everything is driven by supply and demand, and supply and demand always get towards the, where the two curves cross. You know? So that mental picture is so strong you've got to break it and replace it with a, a coherent alternative which is a more realistic description of the system, then you might progress from that point on. That's the main thing I'm involved in. When we look at the Great Depression, yeah. how can we compare, uh, or can we compare, the Great Depression to what we've got today? Yeah. It's the only phenomenon we can, because the key issue that caused the Great Depression was a debt bubble that then burst, and the, the, ri the rising of the debt bubble gave us the boom of the 1920s. The collapse of the debt bubble gave us the depression of the 1930s and the Second World War. This time round, we've got a bigger debt bubble. So if you look in America's case, the level of debt to GDP, private debt to GDP in America, it, it, it reached 175% of GDP in 1930. Yeah. It then increased above that because of serious deflation. We began our crisis with America hitting a peak level of 301% of GDP. So we're talking about 1.7 times as much debt as back then. And then the process of deleveraging, which gave us the Great Depression, the, the, the major impetus downwards is given by the rate of, not the rate of growth or the rate of falling of debt, but the rate of acceleration and deceleration of debt. Right. And the maximum rate of deceleration of debt in the Great Depression hit minus 15% per annum. Yep. In our case, we hit minus 25. Blimey. Now, there's, if you look between the, the, great, the uh, 1945 through to now, absolutely nothing else got outside the minus 5 range. So that's why you can't compare what we're going through to anything in the post-war period. The only comparable event is the Great Depression. We know the uh, conclusion uh, or what the, the Great Depression spawned, if you yeah. like. Um, what's your view on that insofar as conflict, not yeah. just uh, global, but intergenerational? Yeah, really, that's really... I mean, I saw the London riots uh, recently as, as, an, as an indicator of that because you've had a, people have been excluded and downtrodden for so long. Uh, the whole you know, abolition of the welfare state, the de-industrialisation of Britain, which is, you know, a similar thing happened in, in America and Australia as well, uh, leaving a class of people who are living on welfare and subsisting day to day. And, and then the only thing that justifies their situation is the continuing prosperity of the rest of the system from which they're excluded. Well, as soon as that prosperity cracks, you see, as it did, yeah. bang. Uh, and I, but the, one of the great dangers I, I always felt, and this is one reason I dived into the political debate so early, is that I knew what happened last time was the rise of Hitler the rise of right-wing demagoguery. And we've got, we haven't quite got the same fertile grounds as Hitler had at the time, thank, thank God, but we've certainly got plenty of right-wing demagogues out there ready to blame the working class for the problem or blame the welfare state, which has been deconstructed for causing the current crisis, uh, and also to blame migrants and all the usual racial stuff that can occur there. So I think we, you have to get an intelligent, critical analysis out there before this happens, to have some chance of attenuating at least that, that right-wing backlash that could occur. And what's your view? Do you, do you think that that, with the advent of the internet and, you know, and they didn't have it back then, can, can, uh, and um, the, I suppose, mainstream media has been uh, instrumental in driving a lot of the debt bubble, and, mm. and they haven't reported in a way, or haven't asked the tough questions, yeah. um, do you think now that that, that ideology or, or fascism basically can be headed off? Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's a massive I, I hope it can, but I've, the great danger is that when, when, the, when things fall apart, yeah. as they can in a, a, a period of sustained deleveraging, which is what we're falling into now, 
and, and particularly when the response of the state is to impose austerity programs, which then mean people at the bottom are the ones who suffer, having been a, been a problem caused by those at the top to begin with, that just generates such a degree of anger and animosity towards the whole system that you get the chance for a right-wing demagogue to rise on top of that and turn it against you know, racial minorities mm -hmm. and certainly turn it against the class structure. Yeah. So to me, I, I really do fear a rising level of violence coming out of this. The thing is the violence will be blamed on the people who've been the victims all the way through for the last 40 years, suddenly saying they, can't, they won't take it anymore. The real cause has been the growth of the financial sector and that's the sector we should target. And as long as the, the, the state system continues trying to revive the financial sector and get back to the previous behaviour... As if it's an optimum condition. I know, I know. That's, that's all they've got used to. That, that's what they understand as reality. So that the, the only way out of it is for that to be reversed. And you, if you want to head off fascism, I think what you have to have is a politician willing to take on the financial sector. And we don't have that yet. Now, how do they do it? Because where does the money come from? To well, money does, it's not the money come. David Grave has uh, written a great new book called Debt the First 5,000 Years, and yes. he's argued at the end of it something that I've been arguing for and Michael Hudson for a long, long time, and Ann Pettifors, we need a debt jubilee. We need to abolish the debt. Yeah. And then and that means the banks have to be reconstructed. Let's do it. Mm. And are the, bank, are the employees that they say uh, we need their expertise? No, we don't. All their experts said is running large, sophisticated Ponzi schemes that are so sophisticated they didn't even know it is one. So they have to have, we have to abolish the debt, large slabs of it, right of, not, not a case of case by case, across the board, and then handle the, the financial system, force banks to continue to provide working capital for firms, stop them foreclosing on houses, etc., etc. That sort of action is necessary. But we are so far from that action right now, I think we're going through lots of chaos before you get to the stage where a politician will have the courage that Eisenhower had and bring in changes like that. But isn't it exciting if someone did do that? You, know, you have to risk your political life to do it. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, people, many third way people thought Obama might do it. You know, the yes, we can stuff. I mean, yes, we, yes, we can do what Wall Street pays us to do became, unfortunately, <laughs> the outcome, which is, I think, it's a great tragedy. Yeah. I see him being in the situation of Hoover, um, not knowing what he's actually caught up in at the time, and trusting that he was relying upon the experts. Well, who are the experts? Neoclassical economists. Yeah. And also Wall Street advisors. The, and a really unholy mix. So he's not going to be the messiah. Uh, and there's obviously nobody on the horizon who is yet to take that political leap. With the uh, revolutions of philosophical, mm. uh, do you, and a bloodless revolution is what we're talking about here. Mm. Um, so uh, do you think that it'll be leaderless? Do you, do you, because have we had the, the, the moments of li in life where we've had the big president? Because he can't affect change. I think he's a good man. I think he wants to affect yeah, change. Yeah. I, don't, I think he's structurally incapable I of. think that's true. So he's, do you think there's a, a leaderless element? You know, the way these systems collapse is mm. by an intelligent or an informed uh, um, group of people going about what they've got to do themselves, if you like. I think what you're likely to get, unfortunately, you'll get a, a, a level of violence that simply scares the elite at some point. I hate the fact that that's probably going to be required, but you simply don't get people's attention until something like the London riots happens on a grand scale somewhere. And then that scares them so much that they think it's no longer a case of trying to, you know, move along at the margin. It's pitchforks. It's pitfall. It's, it's, either, it's either, you know, uh, after us the deluge type attitude. You need a shift like that before you actually get the political commitment to make a major shift. Mm. Wow, interesting days. Hmm. Lastly, let's uh, wrap up by talking about your homeland. I mean, you're never a prophet in your own land, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, we, you know, especially Australia. Well, there's tall poppy syndrome there, isn't yeah, there? Well and truly, yeah. And uh, you've been on the receiving end of it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's because you were right. And, and, not, uh, you know, mm. and you're vindicated and all the rest of it, but it's just your timing was a bit off. But, well, the but, timing, timing I, I never tried to do the timing. Yeah. I think one thing, I, when, I started, when I came out in December 2005 and said there's going to be a recession, I wasn't going to say it's going to be tomorrow. I think it inevitably has to one is going to be a big one when it strikes. Um, there's an argument some people have made that I, I probably helped scare the Rudd government into the scale of response they put oh, in. Oh, right, right. Uh, because as it happens, one of the anecdotal thing I was interviewed on the 7.30 report by Kerry O'Brien on a live 15-minute session. The day after that, he interviewed Rudd and hammered Rudd about my views, and Rudd was flustered quite clearly. Now, maybe, maybe not, I played a role in the scale of the stimulus. I've got to compliment Ken Henry as well, uh, head of the Treasury at the time, saying go hard, go early, go households, which was the right way to go in terms of government stimulus. But then they brought in the first time vendors boost. Doubling was, the, and that was the problem? That was the problem. If they hadn't done that, I would have been pretty happy about the whole thing. And we would have had a larger downturn. 
okay? Because the first time vendors boost effectively injected $100 billion of additional borrowed money into the economy. There's this small amount of government money given to first term buyers that lever it up by a factor of five or 10 when they go to the bank, drive the house price up by an extra 50 or so thousand dollars, yep. and then hand it over to the vendor who then buys the next place for an extra couple of hundred thousand. You got a renewal of the house price bubble that caused the whole thing in the first place. Seriously. But that was a huge boost to the economy. Well, now that's finally petered out. We're now heading down, down once more. So the timing was, when I was asked about house prices in that particular call, I said a 40% fall over 10 to 15 years. Well, that still gives me, since I made that call in 2008, I've still got, you know, yeah. quite and a few years to go. Of course, and, and, um, and, and it's realistic, isn't it? Because when you look at uh, economies that have got involved in such land speculation, mm. Japan, Ireland, yeah. I mean, you look at Australia and you worry. Oh, yeah. I do. Where do you see them as, as an economy? Where do you see the Australian economy today? Well, the one positive we have, is, as always, is the fact that we're a minerals exporter to China. Okay. Right. The long as the developing countries are relatively booming, we do well out of that side yeah. of things. That, that's an attenuating and a large one, probably one that I underestimated the importance of uh, in previous years. But at the same time, the debt engine has now run out. We're now starting to strike deleveraging, and we have probably the most overvalued house prices in the Western world. The only country that rivals us are places like like uh, Hong Kong and, and Singapore. Yeah, yeah. Um, so from that position, the level of deleveraging and wealth destruction that will go on and the credit dynamics as well, with the banks, I'm sure, suffering badly, uh, that, that will drag us down while China pulls us up. Now, overall, I think we're going down. Mm. So I was for some time, the last year and a half, I've been saying the Reserve Bank will put rates up, fighting an inflation bogeyman, yes. but there's an action there, and be forced to change direction when they understand the deflationary pressure? Well, they never really understand, but when they're forced to, comprehend, forced to cope with the fact that it's actually happening, right. when they see unemployment rising, then they'll start cutting rates. And that's a bonus to Australia in the sense that because we have floating mortgage rates down there, mm -hmm. that directly goes through to the households. It reduces the burden on them straight away. The danger of that process, of course, is it continues encouraging you back into debt again. So it could give us a stimulus by dropping rates and giving more spending power to households. Uh, I hope it doesn't stop the deleveraging because if it starts people back in debt once more, then we're going to head towards the point of no return where household debts hit, say, um, well, the total level debt hit, say, about 220% of GDP. We're currently 160%. I think we're going to go down. Mm -hmm. If they re-encourage the bubble by, by that process, once you get to that level of about 200% of GDP to 220%, there is no way the Reserve Bank can stimulate anything. The only rate of interest they can have is zero. And then at that point, then you hit the end game. And I don't want to delay it to that point. I think we were now in the end Gr game. Grasp the nettle, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's a painful nettle. There is no painless way out of this sort of crisis. You can attenuate the pain by government spending, but you can't stop it. Uh, lastly, a politician thinks of the next uh, election. A, a statesman thinks about the next generation. That's mm. the adage. Um, what will be the societal effect in Australia, in your view? I hope a return to the sort of mentality that existed after the Great Depression and the Second World War, when the emphasis was upon the income standards of the general population rather than promoting the wealth of the very few at the top. We've gone down the elite road, the Macquarie Bank vision of the world, and promoting the, the speculators and the spivs rather than the, the, the working people. Uh, I, I give my students a quote from the, the White Paper on Employment that came out in 1945 to show what the mindset was like after the last great crisis. And that white paper had the following statement. It said, the object of economic policy is to maintain such a pressure on employment as to guarantee a shortage of jobs rather than a shortage of men. Now, living out alongside the sexism of the 1940s, the emphasis there was upon the common person mm. and getting as much of the income as possible for the, for the broad mass of society and not promoting the hoi polloi. And I think we need to get back to that political shift but that is a dramatic change from the type of Australia, we've, the neoliberal Australia we've had built up in the last 20 years. Steve, um, we here at The Renegade Economist admire your work. Thank and you. um, please keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, because really, uh, we, it's now or never. Yeah. And, um, we, you know, we, 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 well, we, we've got to grasp the nettle. Because if, well, if, and if people like you don't, then what are we left with? Yeah, we get back to the neoclassical fantasy once more in another crisis in 40 or 50 years' time. No, no, because no. it will be on a scale unimagined. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for coming by. You're welcome. Um, thank you for um, your time. And also, The Naked Emperor Dethroned uh, is available in bookshops. 
Yep. An- An- Amazon. So Amazon, online, yep. all good bookshops. And, um, and we wish you the very best of luck with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. That's it for us uh, this week. Uh, join us again on the Renegade Economist talk show. Uh, and uh, we'll see you then. Bye. Uh, what happens if you abolish one but not the other? And the theory of the second best that things will get worse. Right. Okay. Whereas the general theory says abolish both, you'll get things better. Right. So it's taking one step towards nirvana, in fact, took you to purgatory, which I thought this is something, if the theory is this weak, if that simple acknowledgement of reality disturbs the theory so badly, yeah. there's got to be something rotten here. And I began looking at that right from the, um, I think I, I actually dated to that to about July or August of uh, 1971. So from that point on, I was looking at the theory and saying, there must be something, a, a deeper flaw here to enable something as, that apparently such robust and strong conclusions that make most neoclassical economists anti-monopoly and anti-union. Yeah. If you suddenly prove that if there are monopolies and you have unions, then you shouldn't abolish unions. And ipso facto, there are monopolies out there on our large corporations, so therefore you need to have unions organising workers to get their fair share. Uh, that just put a hole right through that mental picture for me. And I had to say there had to be a more coherent way to think about the economy, as well as having flaws in this one. And I then spent really my next 40 years pulling apart the theory. It's exceptional. Um, and the work that you've done, because as you said, you've got to knock down every pillar of this. Mm. Because mm. if you leave one thing standing... They'll reel the whole damn lot on that one edifice. Yeah. And and because uh, they're very clever, uh, the guys who benefit from this, mm. who we'll come on to, are very get- clever at using these arguments to, well, loot the system. And, well, it's, these guys, are not, they don't do the looting. This is a bit like the priests who justify what the emperor does. Mm-hmm. Okay, the emperor does the looting, the priests justify the system. And it fundamentally... Near- Interestingly, how did you, get, how did you um, rid yourself of all the dogma and all the, the misinformation that you've just explained and, and be able to see through that and, and then stand in that lonely position to say, hang on... It is a lonely position. But I've got quite a few colleagues. I've got a, there's a huge school of non-orthodox economists. There's a minority within the academic economics profession that I'm part of that group. Um, I have to say I was lucky. Uh, there's something about being born at the time when the Vietnam War was on and I was facing conscription, which makes you think about philosophical and social issues in a way that doesn't necessarily happen today when the main question is whether you buy an iPod or a Pelt or an Android, uh, at least before the crisis hit. And I had someone disturb my mental picture of economic theory in my very first year at university, which was an English academic uh, moved to Australia for six months and has been there for 40 years, called Frank Stilwell at the University of Sydney. And what Frank did was teach us something in the first six months of first year that is normally only taught in the last six months of an honours course. And by the time you've got that deeply ingrained into it and you strike this particular anomaly, if you strike it at all, you brush it off. But when I struck that right... What do you mean you brush it off? Well, you think, oh, well, it's a curly little thing we have to take account of in later developments of the theory, but the theory is still sound. What he taught is a thing called the theory of the second best. Right. And that... uh, is an argument that if this neoclassical theory says free markets are best and competitive situations are best, so we should have a whole lot of small firms and a whole lot of disorganised workers. We shouldn't have large firms and unions. Okay, But the th- theory of the second best is, well, let's say we're starting from a position where we have lots of large firms with market power and unions facing them with bargaining power. Classical economists are the priests of capitalism. Yep. But the, the priests don't necessarily know that there's God. Okay, They have this model, model of God and ditto with uh, neoclassical economics, they have a model of capitalism which is almost, but not quite, completely unlike actual capitalism. And therefore what happens is they don't even realise that they've erected a smokescreen behind which people, if 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 they want to rip the system off, then there's plenty of avenues being created by these guys because these priests are saying the system reaches equilibrium and the more you remove government intervention and controls, the faster it'll get there. So let's abolish silly silly laws like Glass-Steagall, for example, and let's get rid of that. And let's abolish trade unions, and let's get rid of um, tariff barriers, and let's get all, all this stuff, and everything will work hunky-dory. Yeah. Doing, and in the back, background, the, this causes immense chaos in the real world, and various you know, sharks are out there can go up picking up the carcasses and making a fortune out of it. But the, the neoclassical economists themselves are among the most altruistic individuals I have ever known. That's interesting. But the irony is altruism is no defense. Okay. Because this, I quote this in the new edition of Debunking Economics. I had a, a fabulous uh, 
teacher back in my school days who ran would have religion classes and let us have open discussion, uh, never intervening. And one day, one of the students made a comment about some politician whom we were debating over, and he says, well, at least he's sincere. And the class sort of murmured, oh, yeah, well, nobody could deny the guy was sincere. And this teacher, who normally kept quiet, piped up from the back of the room and said, don't overrate sincerity. The most sincere person you'll meet in your life is the maniac chasing you down the road with an axe trying to chop your head off. Now, I never found it... So hello and welcome to the Renegade Economist talk show. It gives me huge pleasure to introduce Steve Keane. He's come over from Sydney to London to launch his book. Uh, and is he the, he's the Associate Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Western Sydney. Welcome. Thank you, Rob. Um, so, uh, Steve, let's start by me uh, saying that you were right about the global economy. Mm. Right? Uh, do you now feel vindicated? Uh, vindication takes a long time because when you, when you call a crisis like this, it isn't just a case of a, what is going to be a two or three year dip. It's not picking a turning point in a standard cycle. Right. This is saying it's an absolute juncture point which will continue going down for some substantial period. So I'll feel vindicated after about eight to ten years, unfortunately. That's a long time. That's a long time. But, but admirably, you're sticking to your guns and you see this as an opportunity to rewrite the economic model. If yeah, you're... I mean, the, the whole reason that... Keynes failed to convert the discipline was that he had a heart attack at the wrong time and the conventional thinkers like John Hicks got in there and totally ruined Keynes's visions and that's what became seen as Keynes's economics. So we are after the Great Depression, which should have been enough of a wake-up call for economic theory at the time, we went back to an even more deluded version of what had preceded the Keynes's work, the Neoclassical School of the 1920s that Keynes derided by saying in one statement that uh, uh, I accused the, the, the we called the classical school, like accused the what we call now neoclassical school of being one of those pretty polite techniques designed for a, a well-panelled board, uh, boardroom, which tries to deal with the present by abstracting the, fu the from the fact we know nothing about the future. Now, what's, Put that in layman's term. What it means is what we do today is affected by our expectations about the future, and Keynes was one of the first people to make a strong argument about that. The neoclassical theory he was fighting at the time ignored that role and said we, we pretended he didn't need to know what was going to happen in the future to make your investment decisions today. And of course Keynes said we do have to, have to know that but we can't therefore we act in a, in a veil of complete uncertainty and therefore our behaviour is affected by our expectations of the future rather than what we can actually know about the unknowable and that therefore determines investment behaviour which makes capitalism a highly unstable system. Uh, but they pretend it was completely stable by completely ignoring the issue of the future. Well, fast forward to where we are now, and what neoclassicals have done since then is, first of all, trammel over Keynes's logics, what they called Keynes, uh, when, what first were called the ISLM models by, developed by Hicks, had nothing to do with Keynes. Hicks admitted that in the late 1970s. Uh, but they rebuilt a theory in which they had what they call rational expectations. Now, it sounds great to say you're rational, you know, what a neoclassical person means by rational is what the English language dictionary means by prophetic. And so they, rather than saying, is, is the, is the pre-Keynesian neoclassical school, as Keynes said, dealt with the present by abstracting from the fact we know little about the future, yep. the post-Keynes neoclassical school deals with the present by pretending we can predict the future accurately. That's no damn wonder they didn't see this crisis coming, because A, they think they predict the future, and B, the future's always rosy. So how did you spot it? And, and I suppose more yeah. interesting...